also everyone who's watching it on Moodle. Um, I will do the slide in, in English as well so that people know what it is. So um, when you use functions, you can set default parameters. So default parameters end up being very useful because they are default values which are generally accepted in, for example, biology. So if we are talking about biology and we're talking about statistical testing, right? Statistical testing normally has a threshold of 5%. So this is generally called the alpha level of a test. And if you set it to 0 0.05, so 5%, um, it, it makes sense uh, to have that. So to kind of build that into a function. Um, things like false discovery rate generally gets set to 10% and things like number of permutations. So if you shuffle your data and do a, a statistical test, then you shuffle your data, do a test again, had to kind of get a baseline of what is significant. Um, then um, the number of permutations that you generally do is like a thousand. Um, so and these are default values. So here we have a function which has a default value. Um, the default value here is the exponent value. So the exponent value here is standard two. So it means that this sum function is actually a function which just does a number. So the in parameter to the power of something that you can specify. If you don't specify anything, it will take the default value of two. So if we call some function with the value five, it will just do five to the power of two, the default. Um, but if we specify exp, um, then the default value uh, will be overwritten and the default value will be set to the value of the variable, which I set to five. So some function will now do five to the power of five. Good, so default parameters, you can use them. If you write your own functions, you can take some sane defaults which are normally accepted in your, um, um, in your, in, in your field, right? In mathematics, or no, in uh, physics, um, the alpha level generally is something like one times 10 to the minus three or one times 10 to the minus five. But in biology, we generally take 0 0.05. Um, Tokvrol cat is not a valid symbol for showing on the mood box. Cat is also not really a mood, although zombie is also not really a mood, come to think of it. But um, anyway, <laughs> so just just try again. There's there's like enough uh, there's enough options. You, you're free to throw in what you want, see what sticks. So that that's perfectly fine. And, uh, all right. So default parameters. Then if we do functions, um, and we already saw this like three dots, so the dot 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 structure, um, this is called a variadic function. So a variadic function means that you make a function, um, but you leave the number of parameters open. So it could be one, could be zero, could be a million parameters. Um, so a, a variadic function is a function which accepts a variable number of arguments. And then we can use dot 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 to specify a variadic, variadic function in R. Um, an example of a variadic function we already saw, and that's the sum function. So um, let me show you an example in R. So if you have in R, you have the sum function, right? And I can sum one, four, and five together. Um, but I can also sum as much as I want. Um, because they are uh, variadic. So I can, I can have one, I can have two, I can have 10, I can have 100 uh, parameters which, give, uh, which, which are inputted into the sum function. So that's, that's the whole thing with variadic functions, is allowing you to specify multiple parameters um, and beforehand you might not know how many parameters or how many elements the user would like to sum up. So as an example, you can create your own sum function in R called my sum here. So my sum is a function which takes an unknown amount of function parameters. And these are specified here by the dots. Um, so hey, the count is my total, just like we did with the uh, counting up the even numbers. Um, initially, it is uh, zero, right? Because I haven't added any numbers. And then I can use a for loop to iterate through the parameters. So I say for x in a list of dot dot dot, what am I going to do? Well, I'm just going to take the number that the user 
gave to my function, add it to the count, and then store it back into count. So, and this will be executed for each of the parameters that the user inputted. So if I call my sum and don't give it any parameters, it will just say zero, but it can also do my sum one, two, three, and then it will just say six. And I can add as many things to this function in, that I want. Variadic functions. You can um, also use named parameters. So if I just make a function called variadic test, which is a function which again takes an unknown amount of arguments and I just return the list of these arguments and then if I call the function variadic test with a single parameter, a named parameter called param1 equals 15, then what happens it and this this parameter is turned into a list. This list gets or the first element of the list gets the name param1 and it gets the value 15. Um, if I call variadic test with two parameters like the first is a is a is a is a single number, the second one is a vector, then it just returns the values that, that get inputted in it that gets input into the function. So it's very useful when you when you create a function and you have no idea um, how much things a user wants to sum up together. So if you don't know how many parameters you are going to expect, um, you can use variadic arguments or variadic functions in R. So a little bit more about the scope. Um, I told you that the nice thing about functions is that the internal parameters are not visible. So we have again a function. Um, this time it just has a single parameter. This parameter is done to the power of two and this is stored to a variable called intern. And then we return the value of the intern parameter. So now when I call my function with the value five, it will do five to the power of two and it will return that. But when I now type intern into the R command, it will tell you that intern is not found because it only exists inside of the function and it never leaves the function. And this is kind of the scope of, of uh, this is called the scope. And this is really useful because of course, you can think about R and all of the packages that there are in R. And of course there's like literally thousands of packages and if you would not be able to limit variables to within a function, then of course you would run out of variable names because you can, if, if I define a function um, and I have a variable X in my function, then it would be impossible for some other person to also have a function which has X. Um, but because of this encapsulation, because of the fact that intern is scoped, inside of the function, every programmer in R that writes functions can reuse this variable name. Um, and it, because it doesn't get, it doesn't escape the function. So it only stays there. One of the things that you can do in R is access stuff in the parent scope. So this is the, so intern, the scope of intern is within the function, but if I am inside of a function, I can have access to stuff which is defined outside of the function. Um, but this is considered very bad practice. However, sometimes you need to look outside of the function to see if something is defined. Um, so one of the things that, that one of the reasons why you would want to do that is being lazy and being a bad programmer. So this is not a good reason. Um, you want to save random access memory, which is one of the concerns in R and I'm, we're going to talk. And one of the other reasons is that plot functions generally uh, use it to read environmental settings. For example, which font is used in plotting? What is the size of the font? Hey, of course, you're not going to, a, a plot function doesn't have like a hundred parameters which each of these parameters, like one parameter being the font, the size of the font, the type of the dot. And so these things generally are defined outside of the plot function itself. And the plot function reads these values when it needs them. Um, so here an example of just being lazy, um, which you should never do. So I define a variable called exponent. I give it the value five. Now I write a function and this function here uses the exponent variable. 
but the exponent variable is not passed into the function so if it is not passed into the function R looks it up in the scope outside of the function so the parent scope the scope outside so it works but it is something that you should never do how should the function have looked like well I should have defined an input variable which takes the exponent of the function like we did before so again exponent 5 some function it takes now two parameters one parameter is the, the value that we want to do to the power of the exponent and of course here when I now call exponent it will take the input variable and it will not take the variable outside um, so this is just to make sure that if you if you write a function make sure that everything inside of the function is only referring to the input parameters if you don't know how many input parameters there will be you need to use a variadic function um, but this is this is just the way to kind of encapsulate everything all right so that was everything that I want to say about functions first functions will come back I think in the assignments there's like one or two assignments to write your own function um, and that will be difficult because it's something that is new for a lot of people that haven't programmed before um, I think variables are very logical right you just define a name and you put something in um, the if statements are based on a, a test if something is smaller or larger than some number it, that is very logical to kind of understand the for loops and the while loops already are harder but functions are one of the hardest concepts in programming and they they always have been so um, I want to introduce them as, as soon as possible um, because they will come back during during the lectures um, that, that we're going to have so a little bit of overview on, on brackets because we already saw a lot of different brackets and we've used them and and just to give you one slide where you can say okay so this is how I use brackets so the round brackets these ones are used when you call a function like the combine function like C round bracket open the things that you want to put into the vector and then you close it um, they are also used in control structure statements like if round bracket open the thing that you want to have tested round bracket close the square bracket specify an index to a vector a matrix or a data frame the double square bracket specify an index into a list and then we have the curly brackets which define blocks of code like in the function right here the function begins and the function ends um, had the if statement has a beginning and an ending so the statement which are the expressions which have to be executed within the if statement um, so had they define blocks of code so what expressions belong to an if statement um, or what expressions belong inside of these functions so the, 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 the curly brackets are, are more or less a beginning and an ending structure so when R sees it everything which in curly brackets is, is kind of made into a block of code so it belongs together All right, so a little bit about escaping. Um, so if you define a string, so if you define a, a, a character or a, a string value, um, then you enclose the strings um, by these uh, double, uh, double air quotes or single air quotes. You can combine strings together using the paste function, like we saw paste individual with uh, numerical values. You can print stuff to the screen using the print function, and you can print them to anywhere, for example, to the screen, but also to a file using the cut function. So the cut function is, is useful when you want to write, for example, a text file, which has some text in there. Um, the print function only prints to the, to the R command screen, so you, you, it, it's not saved into a file on the hard drive. But the, the thing is, is that often you can forget to close this double air quote, right? And it happens a lot, especially when you're not using a text editor, but typing directly into R. So when that happens, um, nothing will, pr will, will be produced, right? Because R still thinks that you are defining something which has to go into the string. So hey, in, often what happens is that you define a variable, you assign something to it, and then you start assigning a long string, which I forgot to close. 
and then you forget the closing air quotes so you forget to close them what happens then in R you see these pluses in front of it when I type 5 plus 5 I expect when I press enter that it shows 10 but it doesn't show 10 and then if, if R doesn't do what you want it to do um, then that generally is because you are still inside of a, a string statement so you forgot to close your string and there's no output for 5 plus 5 since I forgot to close the string before when you notice these plus symbols you just press the stop button a couple of times so in the R window or even if you are using uh, R Studio, there's a stop button at the top um, which you can just click a couple of times and then it will stop execution and then you get back so eh, when you have this input, so this larger than symbol, or yeah, the larger than symbol, the larger than symbol in front of the line means that you can input new stuff. Well, the plus symbol means that you're still working on something that you input. It, it holds the same as if you are trying to type an if statement directly in R. But a lot of this can be prevented by using a text editor, typing the code in the text editor, and then copy pasting it into R. Um, instead of just typing it directly in R. Um, but hey, remember when you type 5 plus 5, you press enter, you don't get any uh, you don't get any output from R. It's generally because either a string is not closed or you're still having an if statement open um, or something like that. And you can notice that by the plus symbols in front. Um, and then just press the stop button to kind of get out of uh, out of the hole that you got yourself into. Back to escaping, because if you want to print something, right, and I want to paste the words hello and world together um, with a space in between, then I can use print, and this will print it to the screen. I can also paste hello world directly into a file called out.txt by saying cut. So cut has, an, has, an, has a named parameter file, which you have to always specify file is, because cut itself is a variadic function. So it's a variadic function which has a parameter called file and then an x number of input variables. But the problem is, is if I want to paste the air quote itself into a file, so if I want to write a file which has like the double quotes in the file, then of course I need to escape this because if I would just say cut quote and then file is out, then of course R still thinks that you're defining a string because the, the string starts with the double quote and it ends with a double quote. But of course if I want to just print a single like double quote to a file on the hard drive and then I need to escape it. So you have the, 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 the slash character for that. So the, the, the backslash character. So if we want to escape a character we need to escape or we need to use the backslash character. So if I want to print a quote to a file or to the screen, then I need to use backslash air, uh, double quote or backslash single quote. We already saw the new line character, so if I want to print an enter to the screen or I want to print an enter into a file, then I can do slash n. The same thing holds for tabs, so the tab character, which is a special character but used a lot if you do tab separated files. The tab character in R is encoded by slash tab. Uh, between quotes of course uh, since the backslash is the character which is the escape character when I want to print a backslash to a file I should double escape it and I can also do a backspace because backspace is for for a computer backspace is also a character so if I want to do a backspace then I do slash p so just to give you guys a small small example of this um, let's go to R Right, so I can do print, right, and I can print um, something, right, and this will show the word something. But if I wanted to print the quote, then I have to do print something. Um, um, I am printing a quote, and then I have to do slash, huh, like this. And now you can see that when it prints here, it says I am printing a quote slash quote the slash is still in here right you can still see it but if we do the cut function so the cut is printing what you see is what you get more or less so here is I am printing a quote quote 
right? And you see that the input continues directly on the same line. And that is because I didn't put a new line there. So if I do something like this, then now it will print a new line behind it. And of course, hey, if I want to print a uh, backslash as well, then I have to do two slashes and then it will print the right character that we want. And, and this is more or less when you use the cut function. The cut function is really versatile because you can use it to print to the screen like I'm doing here. You can also directly print to a file, but you can also directly print to a printer if you wanted to um, or to a, a URL. So and the cut function is, is a very versatile function which allows you to generate output to the screen and, and these kinds of things. But of course, if we want to print special characters like the double quotes um, or the slash new line, so the enter. Um, and of course, you can also do the backspace. And so in theory, we could do backspace, 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 backspace. And then and what, what it will, oh, it actually doesn't backspace it properly. Why does it not do that? Because it should actually, yeah. So um, that's because of the new line. It doesn't backspace in front of a new line. Um, hey, but if I say I am printing A and then backslash, 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 it's just like print, pressing the, the back, backspace key on the computer. Um, so that that's how this works. So a couple of special characters. You just have to learn them, remember them. And during the exercises, we will, we will practice with them so that you guys get a little bit familiar on printing like special characters. When using cut, we print verbatim, meaning we need to make sure that we end the end of line element, otherwise R continues on the same line, like we saw. And so, and we can also use the separator parameter to separate elements. And so if I say cut, hello world, separator is a comma, then it will take the first parameter, second parameter, and it will separate them by the comma. Um, it, it, you can use a space and you can use a, a, a line if you want, but you can set a certain separator. Um, for example, if you are printing um, top separated files, then of course your separator will be slash T. So, because we have to escape the top. All right, so last part, some randomness. So um, getting a random number in R, um, and this is from XKCD. So getting a random number is of course, random numbers are interesting because no one can prove that a number is random. Um, so a random number generator which always returns four is a perfectly fine random number generator. Although the number that comes out is not really random, um, officially it's still random because you can't prove that it's not random. Um, we already saw the runif function. So the uniform distribution is a distribution in which each number has an equal opportunity of getting drawn. So every value has the same chance of being drawn from the distribution. Um, the runif function in R um, specifies, uh, so it has three parameters. The first parameter is the number of numbers that you want. The second parameter is the from, and the other one is two. And from is default zero, two is one. So and normally if you would say runif one, it will draw one random number from the uniform distribution. If you say run if five, it will draw five numbers from the random distribution or from the uniform distribution. If you say run if five comma minus one comma ten, then it will draw five random numbers between minus one and ten. So very similar to the to the sec function which also has a from and to. The Gaussian distribution, also called a normal distribution, is a distribution where values near the mean have a higher chance of being drawn. Um, so if you are thinking about biology, um, then of course the, the Gaussian distribution is a distribution which is very often observed. Um, if you think about human stature, so how big is a human, um, then humans on average are one meter 75 centimeters or something like that um, but of course some people are smaller some people are bigger um, but on average people tend to be the average height of course very small people or very large people occur fewer so hey if you are measuring um, if you're measuring the length of a mouse or if you're measuring the amount, no, not the amount of leaves, but if you're measuring the size of a plant in meters or in centimeters, then if you measure like a hundred plants or a hundred fish or a hundred mice, uh, then the thing that you are measuring automatically becomes a Gaussian distribution. 
So Gaussian distributions are almost everywhere, um, and especially in, in, in biology, they come up. If you want to draw a number from the, from the Gaussian distribution, you use the R norm function. So norm stands for normal distribution. Um, it's officially called Gaussian, but the function in R is called R norm. So if I do R norm one, it will draw one number from a random uh, from a Gaussian distribution. So it could be anywhere between like minus four and plus four. Um, but I can also set the mean and the standard deviation. Um, and the, this is really useful when you want to do simulation. For example, I want to simulate like uh, a thousand cows um, and I want to simulate the milk production. And I know that the average milk production of a cow is like 8,000 liters um, and the standard deviation in a normal population is around like 500 liters. And then I can use the R norm function to simulate the milk production of a hundred or of a thousand cows very easily. Another distribution which occurs a lot in biology is the Poisson distribution. So the Poisson distribution is a little bit different than the previous two because the Poisson distribution is a distribution which is based on whole numbers. So it, it will never give you back 1.5 or um, 7.3. It will, it is the number, it is an, it, it, it's an integer number. So it's a whole number. Um, so if, I think about Poisson distributions, and this is the example that I always use. Imagine that I'm a biologist and I'm interested in uh, bees um, and flowers. Right then, if I look at a flower, then there is a probability that there are no bees on there. There is a probability that there's one bee on there. There's a probability that there's two bees on there. But the probability that there's like a hundred bees on a single flower is very, very low. So that is what the Poisson distribution models. So it kind of models the amount of things on, uh, or the amount of bees on a flower, right? So it, it's very common to find no bees on a flower, very common to find one or two, but then when you hit three to four bees, it starts dropping off. So the Poisson distribution is a, is a distribution which occurs a lot, and it occurs a lot when you are observing um, whole elements um, in a certain, in a certain area or a certain radius, right? The, the amount of people on a square kilometer, right? Finding no people there, one person, two person, three person is very common. Hey, but if you have a square kilometer, finding like a million people on that square kilometer is, is relatively rare. Um, although probably people in an area don't really follow a Poisson distribution. Um, but if you want to simulate Poisson distributions, then you can use the air Poisson function, so the R Poisson function, and again it takes the the the, um, the amount of numbers that you want to have, and it also has additional parameters uh, to 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 stretch this distribution uh, or to make it smaller because hey you have to kind of limit yourself. But Poisson distributions occur in biology also quite quite often. Um, so hey, if you look at a histogram of your distribution, um, then Poisson distributions look like this normal distributions look like this and uniform distributions are just uniformly distributed so every number has the same chance of being drawn. Of course R has a lot more distributions we also have the beta distribution, the gamma distribution, T distribution and all these kinds of things um, but they will come up uh, when when we are talking about things like t-test and then of course we want to draw a number from the t-distribution or we want to look up um, or if we have a t value, we can then look it up into the table to see which p value belongs to a certain t value. But we will get back to this. Um, but remember these three distributions because they are very, very common in, in normal life. Since we are doing science, we want to have repeatable randomness, which is a little bit strange. Um, but if I am doing a simulation study, then my results that I obtained, my, I, want, I might want to have other people be able to redo my work. So for that, especially if I'm doing random number work, I have to have a repeatable randomness. So repeatable randomness can be obtained in R by using the set seed function. So the set seed function is a function um, which you can give it a number, um, like one or two or three or four, you can 
you can come up with your own favorite seed number but from then on the numbers will that you draw will be similar so what I'm doing here is that I'm drawing five numbers from the uniform distribution between 0 and 2 I round them down so that I don't have anything behind the comma um, so when I set my C to 1 and draw five numbers from the uniform distribution it draws 1 1 1 2 and 0 if I set my C to to 2 and I do the same call I get a different I get different numbers being drawn because we are using a different seed so now I get 0 1 1 0 2 if I then set back my C to 1 so I do set seed 1 and then do the same command as that I did before so run if five numbers from the normal dis uh, from the uh, uniform distribution um, rounding them then you see that I get the exact same numbers being drawn as before and this is for repeatable research so if you're doing a simulation study then generally you set a seed at the beginning you draw your hypothetical cows from your distribution um, and then of course when someone else redoes your analysis they get the exact same answers um, so just to prevent um, different people with different seeds getting different numbers normally if you would just do your analysis you would not set a seed um, but if you are writing a simulation study um, then of course you need to have repeatable randomness because of the fact that science needs to be repeatable by other people all right last slide last two slides I already told this last week but I'm going to tell you again programming is like working in a lab make sure you work cleanly and so put your code into a directory put your input data into another directory put your output data into another directory and this is just so that you don't accidentally overwrite an input file um, if I think about some of the input files that I get um, some of them are valuable some of them literally are tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of euros that people spend on getting that file hey, if I think about um, hey if I would sequence a uh, hundred cows then that would cost me a hundred thousand euros so I don't accidentally want to overwrite this file that I got from the sequencing company because the sequencing company is not going to store that file for me because they are massive files they're literally probably like 20 to 30 gigabytes for a single sequencing run so make sure that when you are programming that you know what you are doing and that you don't accidentally overwrite an input file so I put my code in a directory I put my input data into a directory I do a set working directory I load my input files and then I do a set working directory to move to my output folder so that I don't accidentally overwrite a file and destroy tens of thousands of euros of data so that's 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 it's like clean clean code making code that's understandable is very very important one of these things to create clean code is to think of speaking names for variables and functions if I if I define a variable I want to have a name for that variable that makes sense so don't just call your variable X or box like like I did in this presentation right but think of things like uh, my sum right my implementation of the sum function I have a variable called count which contains the count so far or total which contains the total so far right so think about a name which represent what you are going to put in if I'm thinking about if if, if I have research which works on fish um, then fish have a length and they have a weight so it is good to have variables which are called length and weight instead of having a variable called X and a variable called Y right variables you you can choose the name so so take good names since we are um, in this lecture I introduce you to if statements and for uh, for loops and and functions um, use indentation to denote blocks use spaces for this um, not tabs because tabs are different on everyone's text editor 
some text editor give a tab five space or four spaces some text editor give a tab like eight spaces um, hey, align comments in the back so that code looks like this that I have a function called my sum then everything within the function gets two spaces in front of the, 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 the line so all the all the um, all the expressions inside of the function have an indentation of at least two. I then inside my function do a for loop then I add another two spaces for everything which is be inside of the for loop so that the code structure looks that you can see the structure from the code by just looking at it. And comments align on the back. If I have a comment which it is at the end of the line, then if I have a comment on the next line, then just align them. It just use spaces, align them properly, and make sure that they are aligned. It it just makes code very readable for other people because they can directly see, oh, he's beginning a block here. Ah, oh, the the block is ending here. And so reusable code um, and readable code is very very important. Um, why use spaces and not tabs? you earn around 10 to 15 percent more when you use spaces. Um, this is from a Stack Overflow research that they did um, where they asked several developers on um, um, how much money that they earn and um, they looked at the code, the code that was produced. Um, so people who use um, spaces to align things generally earn 10 to 15 percent more than people who use tabs and this has to do with kind of the programming language but independent of the programming language programmers who use spaces to align stuff generally get paid more than people who use tabs um, there's probably a reason behind it um, but it's just one of these findings from from stack overflow research all right so what is the main thing why we want to do this it is because we want to have reproducible results so if I write a script this script should run from beginning to end without producing any errors so if I if I look at um, for example the assignments right so let's go back to the first assignments that we did so the answers to introduction one what is good code? Good code is code that you can do control A, control C, we go to R, right? And in this case, um, I want to clean the R window, so I want to remove all the objects in R. Um, and then have what I want is just to paste it in, and it should run from beginning to end without producing any errors. wonder how programmers that used tabs felt after reading the study by Stack Overflow. Well, they probably started using spaces and then demanded an increase in pay. <laughs> That's what I would do. But no, I've, I've, um, uh, if, if you go to Notepad++, right, um, you can't really see it here. Um, but if we go to the engine.js, um, I don't know if it's visible, but you see these little yellow dots in front here, right? These little yellow dots in front means that there's a space. Um, and you can do that uh, on the top. You have like view, and then you go to uh, show symbols, and then there's a show white spaces and tabs. Um, there's also a show all characters, so then it looks like this. So then you see the enters as well um, um, at the end. Um, perhaps I have to zoom in a little bit so that you can see the... Uh, so there, there are little yellow dots here in front. Um, so... Um, and that's, oh, 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 no, don't do that. Um, so view, uh, show symbols. But I always have the uh, symbols open. And I change something. No, here. Right, so the, the and tabs look like little arrows. Um, I can't show you that because I automatically change tabs by spaces. Um, but if you see little arrows, then those are tabs. And they, they cause a very messy layout if you use um, tabs. Some languages actually force you to use tabs. If you think about things like Python, Python the layout matters. So having two spaces or having four spaces or having one tab or having two tabs is a very is different in Python. 
Python doesn't use brackets to denote blocks, it uses indentation. So the, the indentation of the code determines if something is within a function or if it's outside of the function. Um, fortunately, R doesn't do that. But hey, clean and reusable code is very, very important. So make sure you can run a script without any errors. So when, you, when, you've, when you're done with the assignments, hey, close R, open up R fresh, select all of the text, copy paste it in, it should run from top to bottom, give you all the answers, and it should not produce any warnings or errors. Also warnings, fix warnings. Warnings are a sign of something being wrong. So um, make sure that they don't happen or that no errors or warnings occur. All right, so that was it for today. Nice, we finished almost just in time. So 4.50, so that's really good. So are there any questions for today? Um, I know that today is a little bit of a hard lecture because of the function part. Don't worry too much about the function part. Um, it will it, it will come back in the future um, and we will go into more detail. And um, it's just that I, I want to introduce this as quickly as possible so that you know that hit, you have variables, you have control structures, and these things are put into functions to create reusable components, which you can use over and over and over again. All right, so for the people of Moodle, I will stop the recording. Um, although, no, wait, there was an... I got an email from one of the students, and I should mention that before we go. Um, yeah, it is about the exam and about um, the assignments. So the assignments, I am not going to check. We are going to do them during the Zoom meeting, um, and we are going to. I, I'm going to show you my answers at the beginning of each lecture. But you don't have to upload the assignments, and I'm not going to give you a grade for if you do the assignments. Cultiviert, thank you for following. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm not going to um, check your assignments. I'm not a high school teacher. This is a master course. Um, PhD students follow it as well. Um, so they are for you. If you want more assignments, because you want to practice more, just ask me. I have a whole document, like a PDF document, with literally like 50 to 100 additional assignments. Um, and the only way that you're going to learn how to program is just doing assignments and programming stuff for yourself. Um, which is why it's really good to have a... Um, uh, to have a data set in your hands, right? If you're already doing a master project or you just started your PhD and you have a little bit of data, um, then it's really fun to use R to work on your own data. Um, the second point that was asked is um, the exam. Um, so everyone who is part of the Humboldt University is getting credit points when you pass the exam. So we will have the exam all the way at the end of the lecture series, of course. Um, so if you pass the exam, um, you have to, well, for the exam, you have to sign up via this Agnes system. Um, and you sign up for the exam, then you do the exam, and then uh, your grade automatically gets sent back to the Prüfungsbüro. So I will just check your exam and then put your grade on a list, and I will send that back to the Prüfungsbüro. For the people, um, who are not from the PQM module, the module will be in your VAL, VAL, mod, VAL part, so in your kind of free room in your master where you can choose it. Um, for the people who are from external universities, it's a little bit different um, because they can sign up via the Agnes system if they contact our Prüfungsbüro beforehand. So you have to contact our Prüfungsbüro um, and then you can and they will ask you, well, what's your name? Which university are you studying? What is your matricle number? And these kinds of things. And then they register you for the exam. However, you don't have to do that because you can, in theory, just join the exam and then you get a Leistungsschein for me. And with this Leistungsschein, you can go to the Prüfungsbüro of your university and they will give you the credit points. For PhD students following the course, you do not have to take the exam, 
because for PhD students um, they are not um, they don't have an uh, they don't have to do the exam because they just have an attendance um, so but I like people to do the exam um, so PhD students if you do the exam you get a Leistungsschein if you don't do the exam um, then you can still get a letter of attendance certifying that you followed the course so that's that's up to you what you want um, but uh, If I close R and I'm asked whether to save the workspace, if I then press no, nothing is saved anywhere, right? Yes. Always answer no. <laughs> the, the, yeah. And if you want to check, you open up R and you press LS and then execute the function, right? So if you go to R um, and, um, well, let me clear out R, so remove all objects, yes. Um, so if I do LS, and so if you open up R and you do LS open close, then it should say character zero. Nothing is defined in the workspace. So yeah, nothing is saved anywhere if you press no, which is how it should be because you don't want to one day wake up, open up R, have to wait 30 minutes just because you loaded in a five gigabyte file, which it now has to reload because you're starting R. How many ECTS is the course once we pass the exam? Um, six, I would say, from my mind. Um, you can find that on Agnes, I think. Uh, let me let me make sure that I'm not telling you something. So you get four semester Wochenstunde, which is six ECTS, I think. Yeah, six Leistungspunkte. So it's four SVS, six likes them prompt. Six, yeah. All right. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you guys for uh, for being here, for um, joining, and um, I put the assignments already online. I have to do some fiddling with the recording to make sure that I recover the first part that I didn't record. But for the people watching on Moodle, um, I will stop the recording here. Um, and I will see you guys next week.